Bobbish. Uh, so next is my great pleasure to introduce Heather Miller. Actually, there are, I am convinced there are several people who look just like you. Really? Uh, yeah. So at one point you held jobs in both Switzerland and the United States. She's been, uh, she was a founder of the Scala Center, so she's done great work with Scala. She's done work with distributed systems. She's done great work uh, community building. Uh, she's currently a professor in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, you know, yesterday we sat there and Heather was enumerating you know, six things that she could do for a keynote. I, they all sounded great. Um, and you don't so, know which one it yeah, is. Yeah, well, I... Yeah. Oh, you, I, you mean I don't know? What? You mean I don't know? I don't know. Okay. Do we'll find out. So, uh, <laughs> give Heather a warm welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning. Um, so, as Mike said, my name is Heather Miller. Um, I'm a professor, or an assistant professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. And as Mike said, I uh, co-founded the SCAL Center in 2016. Um, no longer there, of course. Um, I did my PhD uh, under Martin Rogerski on Scala, and I finished it in 2015. And stuff that I did related to Scala was uh, I worked on the futures library that people use and uh, concurrency, the concurrency libraries that are in Scala. Uh, I did a lot related to type class derivation in the very beginning, um, like 2000 and, I don't know, 12 or something. Um, so I'm sorry for my involvement in that. Um, <laughs> I've been doing lightweight uh, type system extensions for years. What, yep? Really? I'm usually pretty noisy. Is this, I should probably turn yeah, it on, right? Turn it on. Would that be smart? That would be smart. I don't know. Yeah. Does it work? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Better? Okay. Louder? Too loud? Should, should I start shouting more? Um, so I've worked on um, type system extensions, lightweight type system extensions related to Scala uh, and programming models for distributed computing. And I also uh, worked on the MOOCs, the Coursera MOOCs. Um, I did one about uh, programming with Spark and also worked on all of the functional programming MOOCs. Um, and I joined uh, CMU as an assistant professor in 2018 and the stuff that I do at CMU, um, you know, I, I do a lot of random things and I'm going to enumerate them uh, shortly, but kind of the high level idea is usually stuff around distributed programming and, uh, you know, it could be like a language based sort of approach or it could be uh, stuff related to the runtimes that we use when we want to program distributed systems. Um, I work with uh, several uh, people. Uh, two of the PhD students are there. There are other folks in my group as well that are not PhD students. Um, you might know Chris Micklejohn. Um, another person that you might not know, his name is Matthew uh, Wiedner. Um, the stuff that we work on in our group, um, so I'm working with Matthew on um, a new kind of foundation for building CRDTs. So it's sort of like a mathematical kind of reformulation of these things. Um, and the idea, or the goal, the reason why we're doing this is because we want to make um, CRDTs more composable. We want to use them like regular functional data structures if we can. Um, and with Chris Micklejohn, um, lately we've been working on trying to do fault injection um, as a kind of testing that's done at, at CI time rather than shutting down random parts of your data center or modeling things in TLA+. So these are like two of the big research projects that we're working on in my group. Um, we also do a number of other things. Um, so we're working on a project that's all about um, trying to check global configurations of microservices before they're deployed. Um, I'm working on data structure for federated machine learning, which is basically moving your machine learning training off, like, you know, job or whatever you want to call it, your optimization stuff to the, to, to like, edge devices, basically, so, or, or smartphones, things like that. So we're working on um, coming up with a way to help people who are building these federated systems uh, you know, program these things more easily. And um, I actually also, it doesn't seem like it maybe, um, but we, I do projects related to um, open source developer communities and I'm, I'm collaborating a lot with people at CMU who do this. Um, and we have a project right now about how ideas spread in open source communities. Um, so I'd really like to talk about some of these things, but that's not the topic of the keynote. Uh, as you might have noticed, it's this uh, open source numbers I think everybody should know. Um, so I've been collecting for a long time a lot of data about um, trends in open source. And you might be like, well, oops, my lap 
pop just froze. Go forward. No. Hold on. All right. Sorry. That just it just freaked out. Uh, so you might be like, well, all right, so if you do all this funny distributed system stuff, you do things related to functional programming and type systems, then why, why the heck are you talking about open source stuff? Um, and that's because, like, you know, after working on, after, like, making type class derivation possible uh, as a PhD student with Eugene Bermako, when we were like, okay, let's change the... The you know the way that Scala you know Scala finds or looks up implicits and like let's design a macro system like we kind of worked on these things together, um, you know and that was like a really hairy problem uh, and then working on type systems extensions concurrency and things related to asynchronous computing, I I, I think I will agree with this guy called Jeff Bigham who is a professor at, at CMU and in, in, uh, in the School of Computer Science and he argues that the two hardest problems in computer science are people. Convincing computer scientists that the hardest problem in computer science is people and off by one errors. Um, <laughs> I, so I, I honestly, after like poking around in things that were way too complicated, I, this is, I, people are still far harder in my opinion. Um, and when I ended up in charge of the Scala Center, um, I you know, had to shift my focus from all kinds of weird nitty gritty things that I was focusing on to uh, you know things that were going on in open source Scala and what was going on with our community and how to sort of grow and make this community healthier. Um, and I should point out that this wasn't just people who were paying into the Scala Center. I wasn't like doing this for them. I was doing this because anybody with an internet connection should be able to join like a you know a healthy, happy community that works on on and around Scala. But you know having to to, to pivot from weird nitty gritty academic stuff to community uh, issues, there was suddenly, you know, my, my focus was, okay, I don't know very much about this community thing. Uh, how, do I, how do I try to do something to make it better? Um, and so there were a lot of problems uh, with the health of some of the projects in, in, the, in the, the core community, sort of um, like libraries and things that people use. Um, and I, I started just trying to figure, you know, as an academic, I'm like, well, Surely somebody has thought about some of these things before, and I started digging around in research. Um, turns out that there's not a whole lot of research on it. There's becoming more and more research these days. In the last maybe four or five years, people are starting to do research in open source communities and communication in them and things like that. Um, but at the time when I was just getting into the Scala Center, there wasn't a lot of research, except you know, people sort of proclaiming that this was a lot of the problems that I was seeing were problems all over the open source community. Um, in other languages, whatever, like everywhere. Um, and so back then, I started, I started collecting data. I mean, and, and the data is mostly like uh, government statistics or um, things that other people have written. And I have this, what I think is like a nice picture of things that I've observed, um, sort of exemplified in data. And I like uh, showing people who work, um, you know, who work as programmers. Uh, these data points because I think it's 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 a, a number of data points that you should just kind of have in the back of your mind uh, day to day and it should I hope change your thinking about uh, how to engage with one another and also um, how to you know think about giving your time back to open source projects so there are three points um, there are three things that I argue are changing um, first how we build software is changing really quickly uh, so when we sit down to build something I don't, whatever you want to call it, it can be an app, it can be whatever, anything. We sit down to build something, we build it way differently than we did five years ago. Um, a lot of things are happening and changing in open source in the last five, ten years that we should all just be aware of because we think, you know, these things are open and available to us and we can just use them. We should know a little bit about how things are, are evolving in open source land. And then also like what we think of a software engineer. Um, so if you want to hire somebody to be an entry level developer at your company, what skills do they have? Um, so I talk fast and I'm sorry. Um, I can't stop that. I've tried for years. It's not going to change. So I apologize in advance, but I have a lot of, uh, like a lot of the things that I'm saying as, uh, as you know, text on the slides and a lot of graphs. So hopefully that helps. Um, but I'm going to kind of run through uh, a number of data points in these, five, in these three areas. And the first one that I'd like to get into is basically how people uh, are getting into tech is, is changing. Um, and uh, the first point 
worth making is, uh, I think we already know that hiring is difficult if you need to expand a, a team of developers at your company. Um, you know, I know I come from the US, and the US has its own issues with hiring, but uh, this is actually a, a rather global trend. Um, so these, these data points, uh, I mean, usually these websites are all focused on US companies, right? Um, but this is nothing you know, surprising. We see these articles all the time. Um, and I actually like, went and collected some data points about Germany as well. So I actually really wish I, I knew the right place to look to find this for like overall all of Europe. But um, according to uh, the internet, um, <laughs> uh, so about 8% of, of jobs uh, that, are, that job postings that go up are destined specifically for developers right now in Germany. This is, these are numbers as of May 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, open developer, they, there remain lots of open developer jobs that are, are unable to be filled. Um, just in Berlin alone, there's around 5,000 right now, or whatever, right now as of May 2019. I presume it's not super different. Um, and, you know, if you look at things by state, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of states where a number of, uh, a number of openings are, are, exist that are hard to fill, basically. Um, so I, I wish that I, I knew the right place to look to find like government projections. I don't, and I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to show you numbers that I have for the U.S. Uh, I, I I know there are differences in the labor markets between the U.S. and, and Germany and, and Europe in particular, um, but I think that still this trend of there being an increasing need uh, is basically the same across the U.S. Uh, the U.S. and Europe. So um, in the U.S. right now. Um, so this is, so I, I went and I got um, statistics because, you know, the U.S. has lots of problems, but for some reason we're pretty good at collecting statistics about the, uh, the number of people that graduate with specific degrees and the number of jobs that are currently open, as well as the projections for, you know, how many jobs are expected to have to be filled. So if you combine, um, you know, the, the numbers from the Department of Educational Statistics and the Department of Labor Statistics, you get this interesting picture. Um, this, for various reasons, um, you know, I, we only have data up until 2015 um, because for some reason it takes the Department of Educational Statistics a bunch of years to publish these things. Um, but this is uh, what the recorded numbers are for people who have graduated with CS related degrees, people who are expected to be able to go into a developer job um, in blue. And uh, these are the projected numbers uh, from the same uh, department uh, in red. So this is, this is what it, it looks like. So obviously there are an increasing number of people graduating with uh, computing related degrees. Um, so the last available data point was that there were 60,000 people who graduated with some kind of computing related degree in the US that could go into an entry level development job. Um, and that, you know, the growth rate is about 7% per year. Um, so this is the growth of people getting degrees. Uh, and you might, uh, you, you know, right now in the US there are over 500,000 computing related job openings that haven't been able to be filled. So this is, you know, just like overlaying it on top of uh, this, this current graph, that's, that's, you know, more, if, even if I stacked up a bunch of these bars, there's not enough uh, people to fill those, those positions. Um, and even when you take into consideration these, these coding boot camps that are very popular, um, you know, in recent years, they've, been, they've gotten better at sort of um, producing um, numbers for how many people have graduated from these things. Uh, and coding boot camps are growing faster than uh, universities are. Um, they're growing at about 14% per year, I think. Um, but th these are the projected numbers uh, for, for coding boot camp graduates. Um, and then if you listen to the Department of uh, Labor and Statistics in the US, uh, they project uh, this, you know, on this slide, whoops, here, this, this, this 500,000 number, they project it to increase to 3.5 million. So if you overlay that on top of like the numbers I just showed you, I don't know how you're gonna like pile these bars up and fill that up. I mean, if they're actually right, uh, this looks like a problem, right? Um, again, this is a US-centric view. I don't know how to get these numbers for Germany or Europe, so if anybody would like to like email me or something to tell me how I could find those numbers, I would be very grateful. Um, but I mean, the, the problem still stands. Um, the I think the 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 so something like four percent is like the the rate of growth per year 
um, in, in computing in the computing profession in Germany as well. So it's it's not it's not a little bit. It's a lot. Um, and the Department of Labor or sorry, Department of Educational Statistics uh, estimates that only about 90% of the jobs can be filled by people uh, who leave the U.S. or who leave U.S. or who graduate from uh, U.S. bachelor degree uh, granting programs. So clearly, uh, we don't have enough people, at least in the U.S., to solve these problems. Um, so, unrelated to these fun labor statistics that are super boring, actually. Um, you can actually also see these things in, uh, in Stack Overflow numbers. Um, so I, I know that this is like a little pixelated, but uh, if you look at the developer uh, survey results from 2017, 18, and 19 on Stack Overflow, uh, you see a trend um, where you have you know, people, so this is, these are all um, the results from the people who are, you know, uh, sorry, from the question, um, you know, how many years have you been coding professionally? So how many years have you been working, right? as a professional developer. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, in all of these graphs, the majority of people have been um, programming for, you know, professionally for less than five years, most of them on the order of one or two years. Um, since, these th since these numbers are banked differently from year to year, it's kind of hard to show uh, a really exciting, interesting trend. But if you look at things um, you know, around the, the, the sort of five year mark, you can say, uh, 51 or 50 percent of people in 2017 have up to five years of experience. So uh, basically, 32 percent have three years or less. Uh, in 2018, um, 57 percent of people had up to five years of experience. So you can see that this number is is growing. Um, and then 41 percent of people in 2019. Again, it's not a beautiful comparison, but still, the point is that uh, you know 41 percent of people have less than five years of experience. So I hope what, it, what you see here is that this number is. Is, is increasing. That people are getting jobs, uh, and you know most people have actually very little experience. Um, and so the, the the thing that I I wish you to like, you know, connect the dots and realize with this slide is um, we have a lot more newcomers in our profession, um, and we're going to have a lot more newcomers, uh, you know, in the future as well. So um, you know, especially in the U.S., uh, there's this tidal wave of of newcomers entering the profession. And it's just going to keep on uh, picking up speed. Uh, and basically, what the Stack Overflow numbers show is that the number of years of experience of practicing software engineers is dropping overall. Um, and so there are people publishing articles about this in the communications of the ACM. Um, and they, I mean, you know, this is just one of a few articles, right? Um, but people uh, argue, um, especially. So this is this is uh, quoting somebody who co founded a, a coding boot camp. Um, they say they, they basically argue that, that that new frameworks that people are using that are all open source have a tendency to basically uh, reduce the barrier of entry uh, to programming professions. So um, rather that so basically what this what this founder of this coding bootcamp says uh, is this new frameworks are lowering lowering the barrier to entry. Um, rather than typing uh, these seven lines of code to get a menu to pop down, you just download this framework from a code base that allows you to do that in a simpler way. Frameworks are taking the hard work that developers pride themselves on out of the equation. Um, and uh, another point to mention, um, there's no shortage of articles like these either. Um, existing developers are burning out all over the place. Um, and there are some, uh, you know, some arguments for why this is the case. So unable to, tell, uh, to fill tech vacancies, employers shuffle off additional duties to current employees, which leads to burnout and has a negative impact on local business development. Over 30% of respondents uh, to, a, a, to an Indeed poll, so we all know Indeed.com, uh, they, they, over 30% uh, of, of, uh, of respondents surveyed admit that uh, this issue accelerates staff turnover. Um, and this, this is a quote from uh, the blog article um, in response to that poll. Uh, with companies unable to fill, fill, oh wait, it's the same one, right? Okay. Yeah. Over, thir over, uh, over a third of respondents were surveyed said the lack of timely hiring caused burnout. So this is the same point. This is somebody interpreting uh, this, this, this data. Um, so, I mean, you know, you could also say, well, increased diversity will help, right? Because there are more people that we can just throw into our pot to make, it, uh, to make these things better. But, um, you know, another, another observation is, well, if we got better at uh, immigration or if we got better at, at dealing with remote work, uh, we might end up with more more tech workers, right? 
Um, but really, the thing that I, I think that we should all actually think about um, is that you know we really have to do something. Um, we probably have to actually be better humans to those around us, and we need to probably get good at mentoring. Um, so I, I want to just make a quick diversity point um, because uh, I mean I don't know. There's a lot of people who make arguments about diversity, and this is um, actually research that a friend of mine at CNU does. Um, and you can't really publish these things unless you can you can say that you know with, with you know confidence that these observations are true. Um, and so th my colleague at CMU has done a research project uh, studying um, how long people stay on teams uh, and you know whether whether their gender makes a difference. Um, and basically, what he found uh, was that uh, software teams that are more diver diverse tend to be more productive. Um, and to quote the paper, holding other variables or other compounds fixed, teams that are more diverse with respect to gender and or tenure or experience, so mentoring, uh, tend to write code faster than teams that are less diverse. So when you have people who you know, have less experience uh, and more experience and uh, have you know, varying genders on a team, they tend to, do, to, to produce more code faster. Um, and uh, also another, and this is a different, a different from a different paper that he wrote, which is also interesting, um, is that uh, I'm just going to point this out because if you want to read about it, this is the, the citation here. But um, it turns out that when you look at uh, how people disengage from open source projects um, on on GitHub, it turns out that people who identify as female tend to disengage faster than um, than people who identify as male. Um, and there's a, a lot of research on this, which is actually very interesting. It turns out um, the first thing that people think about is uh, gender, uh, aside from programming skills. They don't even care about people's name, social skills, what country they're in, but gender is super important to people when they encounter a new developer, uh, which is shocking to me. Um, but anyway, uh, this research project that I just mentioned, which is more of an aside than anything else, basically uh, shows that you know if you, so in this case, they're talking about social capital which is, um, in, in, in this case, basically what it means is um, sort of building camaraderie uh, between people. Um, it's a much more nuanced definition than, than that, and I encourage you to look at the paper. But what they found was that uh, on teams where um, people invest in so, like building social capital among the members, uh, you end up um, keeping prolonged engagement. You keep, you keep people engaged longer. Uh, is sort of the TLDR of this research. It's just worth looking at if you care about any of these things. I mean, this is this is uh, peer-reviewed research uh, and you know data that is meaning like you know these 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 arguments can be made uh, you know with confidence that you know they're not terribly wrong. Um, and I guess the the point of, of this of, of me just flashing these things up is that you know science actually says that diversity, people mentoring each other, makes you build better software. And I'm not just, you know, like waving my hands and claiming it. A bunch of research claims this. Um, so then back to the, the main thread of this, this talk is uh, on the topic of how we build software. So um, I, I think that this is not so much of a surprise anymore. But there was a company called LockDuck, which is now Synopsys. They used to run an annual survey asking companies about their open source use. Um, and over the years, uh, you know, the number of people who a number of companies, they, they survey thousands of companies, or well, 1,200, 1,300 companies. Um, over, over the years, um, the number of companies that say they use open source software has, or they, they ran an open source software has increased dramatically. So in 2010, it was 39%, and in 2015, it was 78%, so two times increase uh, in five years. Um, and uh, if you keep going, so, um, you know, back then, in 2016, companies said that the, num the number one reason why they used open source software was that the quality of, of the open source software that they were using was better than what you could buy or better than what you could build in-house. Um, and uh, they also said that, you know, companies uh, in 2015 had decided to use open source options before proprietary so solutions on the order of two-thirds uh, of the companies that were surveyed. Um, so you could say around then, um, open source kind of became the, the default choice. Uh, 2017, that number, uh, the number of companies that said that they increased their open source usage uh, was uh, 60%. And the main reason at that time was uh, low cost with no vendor lock-in. Um, 
And so if you look now, so the most recent numbers that I have are from the 2018 survey. Uh, and at this point, um, Synopsys was scanning people's code bases, basically. Uh, and they looked at uh, 1,100 commercial code bases and found open source components in 96% of all applications scanned. And they found an average of 250 open source components per application. So that's a lot. 96% of the companies uh, used open source by 2018. So that's a, that's a large increase from 2010. So over eight years, basically, you went from one third of companies uh, depending on open source to basically all of them. Um, and uh, this is also a shocking number. Um, in 2017, 36% of code bases was open source components. And by 2018, that, became, that number became 57%. So just kind of scanning all of the things uh, that you know, make up an open, uh, a, a commercial code base. So, you know, I mean, I, I blame JavaScript probably, right, because this is how we distribute packages. But whatever, point is, uh, you know, this number is increasing. Um, and <laughs> this is a weird statement to have to make, but many open source applications are becoming, uh, I'm sorry, many applications that people are building are becoming more open source code than proprietary code, which is weird. Um, so a company called Tidelift is also going around doing um, surveys and sc uh, scanning code bases. Um, and so they have similar numbers. So um, from their research, they can say that around 70% of, um, you know, a business application uh, is open source components. 20% um, is uh, actually the custom application logic and business logic. And around 10% is uh, commodity infrastructure. So you know, we're separating Linux, basically, from, from this calculation. We're not saying that, like, Linux is the 70%. So, uh, com com commodity infrastructure is only 10% uh, of these numbers. So, like, I don't know. Take a minute for, like, just to think about that for a second. Uh, I've, I've been around for probably, I don't know, 10 years in, in developer land. Um, and when I first started, uh, you know, a lot less of what was we were doing was being reused. We were writing things from scratch a lot more than we are now. Now we're doing a lot of piecing together open source components. That's kind of what the job entails more these days. Um, and according to this company called Synopsys, in 2017, I'm gonna repeat this number because it's shocking, 36% um, of code bases, of, of company code bases, or sorry, proprietary code bases, let's say, whatever, corporate code bases, oh, consisted of, of open source components, 57%, uh, I'm sorry, I have to say this more clearly. 36% of these corporate code bases are open source components in 2017. That number increased to 57% in 2018. Um, and according to Tidelift, only 70% uh, of code bases are open source components, um, and only 20% is actually custom application uh, logic, which is like, I'm just going to keep saying that this is pretty shocking. Um, and I guess this is maybe not a surprise because people have been saying to do this for years. Um, so back in 2011, uh, Mike Krieger, who co-founded Instagram, uh, advised uh, new, new startup founders to reuse uh, more than build themselves. So he said uh, back then you know, that you should borrow instead of building whenever possible. There are hundreds of fantastic open source projects that have been built through the hard experience of creating and scaling companies, especially around infrastructure and monitoring that can save you time and let you focus on actually building out your product. Um, Nadia Egbal, who wrote this uh, pretty timeless report on um, open source called uh, Roads and Bridges, uh, argued in a blog article that um, Instagram's $1 billion acquisition, you, you, could say, you could argue that about $143 million of it uh, was actually open source components, right? Like you could just take that piece out and say, well, this is due to open source. Um, and yet, according to uh, Tidelift, uh, which is this this company that's trying to uh, analyze the use of open source and then you know, help connect people who use open source with their creators, um, they find that around 60% of the respondents of their open source survey um, say that they're required to financially support their open source work with their own funds, that they receive no external funding at all. This is 1,200 uh, respondents. Again, this is just people responding on the internet, so I don't know, like, this, you know, I can't prove to you that this is like, ground truth that everybody who, you know, like maybe all of Google was not responding to this survey, right? And they have lots of open source components. Um, but still, it's, it's an interesting number. Um, 
And we all know about terrifying things like, um, you know, the, the heart bleed bug in 2014. Um, so this, this is just a, an anecdote that's interesting to note. Um, so uh, in 2014, we all know that two thirds of web servers were, were using OpenSSL. Um, and back then, uh, there were two guys named Steve. One, uh, one is Steve Marcus, the other one uh, was Steven Henson. Um, and basically, Steve Marcus noticed that this other, Steven, this other guy, Steve Henson, was working full time on OpenSSL. Uh, and Marcus was like, well, hey, how do, you, how do you get paid if you're working full time? And uh, he learned that uh, Steve Henson was doing uh, consulting work just here and there and was making only about a fifth of Marcus's salary as a government contractor. Um, and, and also, it's kind of interesting to note that Marcus had thought he was a good programmer, but he thought that um, Henson was just, you know, much better, and that Henson had been working at OpenSSL since 1998, so it had been a long time at that point that basically he was somehow scraping by. And that Steve Marcus had, had always assumed that, you know, as had the rest of the world, that the OpenSSL team was large, active, and well-resourced, uh, whereas in reality, OpenSSL wasn't even able to support one person's work, um, you know, at a reasonable uh, competitive wage. So um, the, the point is only that a lot of people aren't aware of these, these sort of funding issues. So I mean, uh, industry and government especially build on open source components all the time and have no idea that things like this are happening. Um, and I like this one. I'm always going to show this because I love it. Uh, so this was a few years back, this, these numbers when they, when they were produced, but basically um, there was a research group in Brazil that came up with uh, a calculation, could, basically uh, a calculation for the truck factor based on how individuals moved logic around in commits on GitHub. And they looked at the 133 most active projects at the time on GitHub and determined the amount of information that was being moved around by specific team members. And they found that 64% uh, of the top 133 projects on GitHub w relied on only one or two uh, developers. So the truck factor for those was one or two. And so you're not supposed to read this, uh, but you're just supposed to see the trend here. This is a, uh, a table that represents all of the um, all of the, the repositories with different truck factors. So truck factor one and two are the first two rows. As you can see, that's a lot of repositories. Um, and uh, you know, the observation here is that there's only a few uh, repositories that have higher truck numbers or truck factors. Um, and just to choose some that were uh, low truck factors, uh, actually, so truck factor one was Grunt, um, uh, SAS, D3, and RX Java, which a lot of people use. Uh, truck factor two was Cassandra, Clojure, Netty, Drupal, and Python Pandas. We all probably use these, right? I mean, I expect a lot of people in the use Clojure. We all know who the truck factor truck factors are in Clojure, right? Uh, I think Scala has like a truck factor of six or something. It's not significantly better, but it's slightly better. Um, but the point here is that you know there are a lot of people, or there aren't a lot of people who keep these things going, right? Um, and so one thing that I can tell you that I learned from the Scala community, or the Scala, my, my time working on Scala, is that sort of the ecosystem and the community are really everything. Um, and since I'm an academic and I like papers, I'm gonna throw a random piece of research at you. Um, so there is a paper from 2013 at Uppsala, which is uh, one of the top programming languages conferences. And basically, uh, it was an empirical study on the adoption of programming languages. And they looked at 10 years of repository metadata um, on SourceForge, of all places. But you know, SourceForge had 10 years of data, so that's good. Um, and that's uh, about half a million open source projects. And then they surveyed uh, developers with multiple surveys. And they got up to 13,000 response responses in some of their surveys. And basically what they wanted to try and answer was, well, what are the things that are the most important for de developer uh, decision making when uh, selecting a language? And what they found, um, what these, these sort of like the results that they obtained. Uh, so the different bars are different company sizes. Um, the green bar is the overall number, so maybe we can just look at that for a second. And the most important factor overall um, was uh, the existence of open source libraries. Um, that was the number one most important thing across all of the people who were, were contacted when making a decision about a language. Um, the next most important thing was being able to extend existing code. Um, and then other things like uh, already used in the group, personal familiarity, team familiarity, performance is in the middle. Um, tooling is way down here. That's weird. 
I always thought tooling was much more important. However, according to a lot of developers, uh, all of these other extrinsic factors, extrins extrinsic factors, like you know, people knowing things was far more important. Um, and look at that, simplicity and particular language features are way down here. I guess that's a good news for complicated languages like Scala and Haskell. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, but the point here is, uh, you know, from multiple surveys, they saw that developers uh, value open source libraries as the dominant factor in choosing a programming language, uh, and that actually uh, social factors that aren't tied to the actual programming language, that aren't tied to like fun language features, um, you know, rate highly. Um, so from that, you might say that an open source project, um, you know, is its community, or its success is attributed to its community. And that's true for programming languages or just anything in general, um, that there is a community that's, that's uh, surrounding it and supporting it. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously not done with Tidelift yet because they have numbers uh, to back this up as well. Basically, um, in, in this, in this uh, survey, this professional open source survey that they did in 2018, um, they found that um, basically an active community and the fact that something is reliably maintained are the, no the two number one factors that, uh, that rate as the most important you know, factor in making a decision to use an open source project. Um, obviously security as well, but uh, you know, the fact that it's being, rely like it's, it's being maintained and that there's an active community, these, these things are, are basically coupled, uh, is basically the most important thing, which, you know. I guess from the 2013 Oopsla paper, maybe it shouldn't surprise me, but it still surprises me. So respondents rated an active community as being over 20% more important than the popularity of a project, uh, which is interesting. I'm just gonna put it back to this slide again. Um, the open sources project is actually, in my, in my opinion, based on all these numbers, uh, you know, attributed to its community and the success of its community. Um, so sort of a, an important point that I'd like to make based on that is that community ecosystem um, are basically, you know, the most important factors to consider, uh, you know, in an open, like, or, sorry, the most important factors to an open source uh, project's success. Um, and so, uh, I, okay, I, sh I showed you a whole bunch of random numbers, right? And you're like, well, how do these things relate and why is it all important? Um, you know, and I, I argue that it was in these three categories, so like, Heather, make your case now, hurry up. Um, so, the, the things that I would like you to try to piece together are, first of all, how we build software um, is changing. Um, nowadays, we largely glue together open source components. We didn't do this as much even three years ago, as much as we do now. So we piece together things that have already been built a lot more than we build things new. Um, we, there are sustainability issues in, in open source that we should be aware of and we should do something about as a group of humans that depend on these things. If we're making money off of putting the pieces together, we should probably do something about this, right? Um, and then uh, every year, uh, sort of the average, you know, like number of years of experience of just practicing software developers seems to go down, which is a reality. Sorry, we have to deal with that somehow. Um, and we need to adapt to it in some way. This is kind of good, right? If we're piecing together open source components rather than having to implement every algorithm that we learned in school. Like, that's nice for more people being newcomers. Um, so what does this all mean? Um, as you can see, I keep on pointing out that we're getting newcomers many times so that we don't forget this. Um, and it's also important to note that, you know, in addition to there being a lot of newcomers to our profession, a lot don't have fancy CS degrees. Um, a lot are coming out of these coding boot camps. Um, but then maybe it's also fine that they don't have CS degrees, especially given that frameworks are king nowadays. Being able to make uh, good decisions about what frameworks to use and how to piece things together might be more important. Um, and also debugging things when they go wrong, right? But maybe being an expert at algorithms is less important these days. Um, and, you know, given that applications are now only 20% business logic, again, maybe this is fine. We're shifting the experts to the people who build the open source frameworks. Uh, and the more novice people might be piecing these things together. Um, another thing that's actually a really nice point, you know, to like the cheers of the software engineering research community, we're actually obviously getting better at reuse for the first time. Like we're good at reuse these days. This is evidence of that. Um, 
And the pieces that we and newcomers are reusing are largely open source now. Um, so uh, it's also important to note that I didn't go into detail on the corporate subsidy bit or, or, or funding models of open source because, I, I mean, I could, but I don't have infinite time. Um, but the point here is uh, cor corporate subsidy does help. So that means a company paying somebody to work on an open source project as part of their day job. Uh, about half of uh, people who responded to this survey, I know that 49 plus 62 do not add up, but these are different surveys, okay? Um, please, don't shoot me. This was Tidelift. Tidelift, shoot them. Um, basically, that you know, still 62% uh, of open source uh, projects are self-funded. Um, so this is a problem. It means either we have to shift more of this stuff to being corporately, you know, you know funded by corporate subsidy, uh, or we have to figure out a new way uh, to actually fund this stuff because it's only growing in importance. Uh, and all of this stuff is related. So it sounds maybe independently all of these, do these data points seem unrelated, um, but this is my argument to how they're related. So we're getting a lot uh, of newcomers across our industry. Application are applications are becoming a majority of open source components. Uh, a lot of gluing together uh, open source framework pieces. Um, and uh, open source uh, continues to, to struggle with these sustainability issues. So obviously we have to do something about this to better support these newcomers that we're getting, right? Because if, uh, if you know, random open source projects that people are starting to learn now and just randomly die, this is bad for people who are learning, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, all of these open source components being so important and the way that we change, uh, that, you know, software development is changing where we're piecing these things together more, it's actually, good for this onslaught of new, of new developers that we're going to have to deal with. So, um, you know, everybody in this room is probably pretty experienced, so you're like, okay, fine, why do I care? Um, so for everybody, there, that means that we have to kind of think a little bit differently, um, and I'm going to argue that the most important thing that uh, we all need to think about doing and being better at is becoming uh, good mentors. So as managers, um, the engineers that you're managing are also going to have to become good mentors. Clearly, you had to become a good mentor if you're a manager in order to be a, a manager, right? But uh, putting a, a, an emphasis on mentorship for your engineers is probably more important now than it is going to be later um, because you're going to have to figure out new ways to onboard uh, new and maybe less experienced team members than you've had to in the past. Um, and for people who don't have to manage people right now, mentorship is something that you know maybe you should consider getting better at. And as educators, um, so people, people like me, um, maybe we should be cool with the fact that everybody doesn't uh, necessarily maybe need a CS degree. And maybe we have to figure out ways for them to learn more quickly and affordably uh, so that they can become an application developer. And maybe that's fine. Um, and I'm going to say this one more time. Maybe we should try not to actually forget, or we should try not to forget to actually invest back into open source. I know I keep saying this a million times. Um, but on the mentorship point, um, there's a nice blog article um, called Developers Mentoring Other Developers. Um, and basically, um, what this article points out is that we already have to mentor people. Um, we do that via onboarding, onboarding practices, and we do that via uh, code reviews. Um, so that's already a start, but mentoring that we should all try to get better at and do more of is more structured and formal mentorship, which takes more time, uh, but provides a lot more opportunities for growth. And the argument is that you can uh, retain engineers better uh, if you can help mentor them and help them move up, right? Rather than uh, accelerating this trend of people hopping between companies and, uh, you know, infinitely, right? Um, the only problem is that we don't really have a great way to do this so far. Um, the only companies that seem to be really good at it tend to be really large tech companies. Um, you know, or the other opportunity if you're not working at a very large tech company is to try and use one of these online coding communities like Coding Coach. Um, but uh, the article, since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to go through all the points in the article. But if you want like a detailed uh, explanation of sort of like a structure that you could follow for doing a more de like a more formal kind of mentorship with uh, either engineers in in your company or even random open source engineers that you know would like to just get better. Um, there is a structure for that, and this article goes into more detail about it. And with that, I'm going to uh, hopefully let you escape to get coffee. Um, but I'm happy to answer um, any questions if we have time for that.
only have time for two questions. Two. Okay, yeah. so you and you. Sorry. <laughs> Just one remark and a question. You always focus on these computer science and graduates. Yeah. In my experience, nobody has a computer science degree in section coding. Like in Germany, most people I know code. Yeah. They are philosophy degrees, physicists, anything. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know why you that's focus interesting. so much on that. Yeah. Uh, well, at least in the US, that's not the case. Uh, most people have software engineering, computer engineering, computer science, uh, information technology degrees. Uh, so it's computing related, it's not necessarily computer science. I also know uh, Germany is good at having uh, this like separation also between like applied sciences and um, you know fancy universities, right? Um, and so I know that computer science tends to also be more theoretical here than it does in the US. Computer science is a lot more applied. Um, so when I say computer science, I'm kind of uh, you know futzing up and, and using like the American idea which is, you know, people who build things that are computing related and not necessarily like somebody who does like the theory of computing or something. Um, but at least, you know, in my exposure, you know, even, so I mean, I, I lived in Switzerland for a long time. Um, most people that I knew, at least in the Geneva, Lausanne area, they ended up having some kind of computing related degree, either from an applied sciences school or from a fancy university. So this is just like the data points that I have. I'm actually really excited if there are people with philosophy degrees getting into computing. Uh, that's amazing. The US is super bad at this. Um, recently they've created a bunch of random master programs for people who have like a degree in biology or something, right? To get, you know, get a master's in computer, computer science, which again is more applied in the US. Um, and that's considered to be super fancy and novel. So if Germany's already good at this, I'm super amazed. That's great. I had, I had no idea. The funding situation for open source programming languages is that mostly companies support them. Um, Scala is a weird counterexample because it's partially funded by a company, partially funded by this open source foundation at, at EPFL that I was involved in. Um, but look at Rust, it's supported by Mozilla. Uh, uh, Clojure is supported by Cognitech. Cognitech, I can't say that word properly. Um, Go is uh, obviously Google. I don't know. I just started enumerating them. Most of them are supported by companies. Um, JavaScript is developed, uh, you know, in a very decentralized way, but people are basically paid to be on these, like, TC committees, right, these technical whatever committees. Um, and, you know, that's your job in a company. So even though uh, it's not like one person, one company <coughs> controlling JavaScript per se, it's people who are basically paid to evolve JavaScript. So co corporate subsidy. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>